Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, pension plans and some options with them. Uh, even though pensions, whether or not you work for a company that has one, sometimes maybe your spouse might have one and, and the decisions that they make will have a pretty dramatic impact on, on both of your retirements. Again, we're kind of seeing pensions go away somewhat in the private sector, but there's still probably quite a few of our viewers right now that have them. Obviously, they haven't necessarily gone away that much from the from government employees either. So. What are some things individuals need to consider? You know, you have all these 12 or 14 different options. Sometimes you've got a lump sum option where you can take all of the money out and roll it someplace else. What, what's typically best? And these decisions are very, very serious. So let's spend a couple minutes talking about what's best or how do we analyze what's best? Yeah, each scenario is gonna be a little bit different because what you have to decide is, is you have to decide when and if the, the person or the employee themselves were to pass away. Mm -hmm. Well, what's gonna happen to that pension? If it's, if it's your, your uh, single life pension, then whenever that person's gone, it's over. They're, it doesn't matter if they, if they live one year or, or 50 years, they're gonna get paid. Yeah. But then when they're gone, it's, it's gone. Now, obviously that's only one option though, right? right? So, right. so there's typically, there's gonna be all kinds of different options. If you want the money to last a certain period of time, or if you have a spouse, you want 100% of the money or half of the money or something like mm -hmm. that to go to them. What, what are some other options, Jordan? Yeah, well, I was actually talking to a gentleman the other day and he's, he was about to receive a pension and he was just gonna say, well, it makes the most sense just to take a, a lifetime stream. And I said, well, do you need those dollars for retirement? And he said, no. Mm -hmm. I said, well, were you aware, and you were just talking about it, of the lump sum option? And he had no idea. We were able to call the company and we found out we could take a lump sum, which that was way better for his goals and his objectives. And he was really happy that we were able to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so even though he didn't need the money, yeah. sometimes it can still make sense, even if you do need to generate an income, mm -hmm. to at least get it analyzed. Maybe still taking the lump sum would be yeah. good and putting that money with a company that specializes in pension plans. Mm -hmm. Because kind of what we're seeing a lot is, is there are different employers that offer pensions, you're ready to retire, you have all these different options that you can choose from, some are more attractive than others, but a lot of times individuals don't even take, a, you know, a, a, get a second opinion to see, well, what if I move the money from where it is currently to someplace else? You know, not all financial institutions and companies are created equal. Sometimes they can actually get a higher payout, yeah. right? Yeah, but both for themselves mm -hmm. and for their family, spouse, you know, children, grandchildren mm -hmm. as well. Anything else that individuals should look at? Yeah, one of the biggest things with that, so if you take the lump sum and then you go open your own pension, like you were saying, uh, when, whenever you pass away, well, whatever's left in that account then goes to your heirs and beneficiaries. So mm -hmm. it, it's not gone. There's still something there to pass along. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I, I know one of the things that will run for individuals sometimes is, is what's referred to as a pension maximization. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, and if you have questions on this, you could give us a call at the office. If you have a pension plan, then we'd be happy to run a, a pension max, maximization analysis. But it's true that sometimes individuals can get a higher monthly payout than what their employer is offering, and then make sure that the money will pass on to heirs and beneficiaries, regardless of how long they live. Right. So if we were gonna run a pension maximization, Jordan, what other types of things would we need to know from the individuals in order to be able to tell them for sure what it is that they should do? Well, I guess first and foremost, what do they wanna do with the pension? So if they're looking to get max income, then we would see, okay, if your pension over here is gonna give you, let's say maybe $1,000 per month of income, is there a way that we could roll over the lump sum, like you said, and get maybe a rate of return, which could give us somewhere between maybe you know, $1,500 a month, mm -hmm. to where if we could see if we could beat that potentially. I think a lot of it comes down to really what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. You know, some individuals just need the income just for themselves, right. and, and that's fine. So then you want, might wanna take maybe the, the maximum income that you can get. Other times it is important, you know, as far as what they're trying to accomplish, they are trying to leave money to a surviving spouse or, or maybe they need to leave money to children or grandchildren. So each situation really is very, very unique and different. And it isn't something that should really be cookie cutter. And, and if you're talking with an advisor about what to do with your pension plan, that is something I would definitely avoid is, is trying to go to someone and you just call them up on the phone or maybe talk to them in a, in a meeting and very quickly they tell you, well, you, sh you should always do this or you should always do that it's a really uh, much more complex situation. It's not something that's that easy mm -hmm. to answer. So anything else that you wanna, wanna wrap up with? No, I, I think that if, if you have any questions about whether or not your pension is set up in the most efficient manner, please feel free to call our office and, and or visit our website. So over that same 16 year period, they averaged basically the identical return rate. This one here is worth 2.35 million dollars.
to talk a little bit about how much consistency counts into and throughout your retirement. And I'll show you what I mean by that here in just a few minutes. Right now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the years 2000 through 2016, and we're going to compare two different portfolios together. So on the first one here over on the left, this is John. These are two brothers, John and Bill. Both of them have a 401k worth $1 million. And let's just say we've got, uh, well, actually, this is the Vanguard S&P index from 2000 to 2016. It averaged 5.67%. So we're going to say Vanguard S&P index. This one here, we're just going to call it the AWP. So this is, a, this is just a, a portfolio that uh, this is a, a fictitious name, but, but what, it's based on real positions. So it's averaged 5.66% from 2000 to 2016. So basically, together, they're almost identical. Well, both of these accounts have, have a fee associated with it. Now, when it comes to Vanguard, they have very, very low fees. So the fee is 0.04%. So Vanguard's fee almost feels like it's free, but it's there. With the AWP portfolio, the fee is right at 1.5%. So we're going to say fee 1.5%. Now, where these two start to differ a little bit, on the first one over here on the left, the results uh, after a 16-year period, he started one, $1 million. After 16 years, it was worth $1.85 million. Okay, so pretty good. He grew his portfolio pretty significantly over the last 16 years. Now this one over here is significantly different. So over that same 16 year period, they averaged basically the identical return rate. This one here is worth $2.35 million. So how is, that, how is that possible? So they both averaged the same amount. They were both in the um, accounts for the same amount of time, but yet we've got drastically different results. $500,000 difference in the two accounts. So why is that? Well, the reason is, is with the S&P index over here, the, the Vanguard was in the market. It did very well some years, but it also did very, very bad some years. So, and it participated in all, all of that growth. It was going up with the market and down with the market. Where the, the managed portfolio over here, the AWP portfolio, well, it was participating in, in some of the, of the positive, but not all of it. And then when the market is down, it, it's just participating in a little bit of that, of that downside. So what we're doing is we're trying to get some consistency here. We may never, never hit it out of the park, but we're also not going to get any, any huge outs either. So we're just going to get consistency over time. So what I want to do is, is uh, I want to talk a little bit about how much consistency counts. And I'm going to show you how this could happen. So in example A over here, we've got, we're just going to call it example A. Let's say we start with $100,000, and the first year, we get a 30% gain. Well, now we're at $130,000. Then the second year, we have a loss. Oh, the second year, we, we go down by 20%. Well, we just lost $26,000, so we're at $104K after those two years. So we average... So plus 30 minus 20, so we average 5% return over the last two years, and we're at $104,000. Now, in example B over here, what we're going to do is, is uh, we're going to participate in some of the upside, but not all of it. So let's say we've got 100 k up 15 that first year. So this is example B, so we're at 115 k the second year, we participate in some of the loss, but not all of it. So let's say that second year, we actually go down by 5%. Well, we're now down to 109,250. So they both average the same rate of return. So up 15, down 5. So this one averaged 5% over the last two years, but we've got 109,250. I'm going to go back to this one. We average 5%, but we're only at 104. So why is that? Well, it, it's because well, a, a, a loss is going to hurt you a lot more than a gain can help you. So as long as we can manage the downside risk 
and we don't give back as much as we're, we're receiving when the market's up, then you're going to see a significant difference over time. So if you have any questions about your portfolio and how you can take advantage of the upside but not take all the losses when the market's down, feel free to call our office. Now a lot of people who are planning for retirement or have been already planning may not have started planning early enough and now they're trying to catch up, they're trying to play catch up. A lot of times they're trying to make up for years lost and today I really want to talk about some simple practical strategies that will help us catch up and get back on retirement target. On this segment of Strategic Wealth University, we're going to be talking about catching up in retirement. Now, a lot of people who are planning for retirement or have been already planning may not have started planning early enough, and now they're trying to catch up and they're trying to play catch up. A lot of times they're trying to make up for years lost, and today I really want to talk about some simple practical strategies that will help us catch up and get back on retirement target. Now, I know sometimes if you started later, if you're thinking about starting, it can be a scary thing, just taking those first few steps. And the first strategy, really, and it's pretty simple, is to save more and spend less. Now, I know this sounds so easy and so simple, but the truth is, is most individuals who are progressing or planning for retirement are not doing this. So if we look at some past studies, and one in particular is a study that Ernst & Young did a few years ago. And what it showed was that about 65% of those going into retirement are not retiring with enough money to maintain their standard of living throughout their entire retirement. So again, about 65% of those going into retirement, they're not retiring with enough money to maintain their standard of living. So another way of saying that is that about 65% of people planning for retirement didn't save or plan enough. So again, the first strategy is to save more and spend less. You know, try to set yourself a budget and really whatever you have to do in order to get yourself on track. So think of this, the pain of discipline is a lot less than the pain of regret. We would much rather suffer in a minor way by saving a bit more now than regretting deeply in the future if we did not save and plan well enough for retirement and potentially feel poorly about it. The second strategy is that we can downsize our home. And again, this isn't exciting to talk about, but this can make a major impact on our retirement planning. And oftentimes there is a significant amount of equity in our homes. And because for the most part, an individual's home is their single largest investment. Now another solution or strategy is to work a few extra years. And again, that might not be very exciting, but that could give us more potential future income. And of course, if we think about it, just knowing that every extra day that we work, that means a little more money in our pocket every day in retirement. Now the next option is to consider getting a part-time job in retirement. Having the freedom and flexibility to choose your hours can take a lot of the pain out of working. And knowing that you have a choice can refresh your work and ultimately potentially you. Now the last strategy, and it's really powerful, is to keep a ledger of all of your expenses. And I know it sounds simple and it sounds like a lot, but it can have a major impact. Um, I've met with numerous retirees who were having trouble with their expenses and really they started to implement this and they started to plan day to day and see just how much they were spending and purchasing. And I actually had a couple one time, uh, they needed about $5,000 of income per month in retirement. Uh, we started to analyze their expenses and what we found was that they could really live off of about $3,300. That extra $1,700 per month was so exciting and liberating for them. Uh, they were able to help pay for their grandkids' braces and actually uh, go on a beautiful trip together that they'd never imagined that they could. Uh, also for our younger viewers who are maybe just starting out, this can really help you instill some disciplined budgeting, which over time can really add some years of income to your retirement dollars uh, towards saving. So once you get into a habit of keeping a budget, it can actually start to become kind of fun. Uh, so again, just to recover everything, the steps are to save more and spend less, downsize your home, work a few extra years, and then also set up a budget. So if you are behind on your retirement planning, there are a few ways that we can catch up, but the first step is to determine if you're behind or not. And of course, there are a lot of variables that go into retirement planning, and this is something being um, that if our clients are behind or not, that we could really help them um, from time to time. But if you'd like more information on how to determine if you're behind on your retirement planning and build a plan to catch up, please give our office a call or feel free to check us out on the website. The way an A-share mutual fund will work is when you buy into it, you pay a front-end sales load. Now, the more money you invest into it, typically the lower the sales load goes. So you, get, you can have what's called breakpoints. If you're investing a little bit of money, into an A-share mutual fund. You can pay a sales load that's five to 6% up front.
Let me talk with you a little bit about the different share classes that you can buy into when you purchase into a mutual fund. And I want to talk specifically about one of the share classes that I really encourage everybody to avoid completely. Now, when you buy into a mutual fund, typically if you go to some sort of a uh, registered representative of one of the large uh, brokerage firms around town or maybe one of the banks, you're going to either buy into what's called an A share, a B share, or a, or a C share mutual fund. Now, the way that you can determine which share class that you have is by taking a look at your most recent statement, and it'll usually have the name of the mutual fund, and then it'll have either an A, B, or a C at the end of the name, or maybe even says C shares or A shares or something of that nature. So your statements usually can identify what share class that you have. The way an A share mutual fund will work is when you buy into it, you pay a front end sales load. Now, the more money you invest into it, typically the lower the sales load goes. So you, get, you can have what's called breakpoints. If you're investing a little bit of money into an A share mutual fund, you can pay a sales load that's five to six percent up front. So if you put in $1,000, they're going to take five to ten percent or five to six percent off the top uh, of that, and then the rest of the money will be invested. Moving forward, you're going to have some management fees and transaction costs, but then when you're ready to sell out of that mutual fund, you can do so without any uh, additional fees or penalties. Uh, the next share class is a B share. And it works basically the exact opposite. If you put in $1,000, all $1,000 gets invested right up front. And you won't have to pay uh, any type of a sales load unless you sell out of that mutual fund, typically in the first six years. Some are as short as three or four, but most of them are six years, meaning if you invest in the fund and then say in year two or three, you want to sell out of it and spend the money or do something different, you're going to pay some sort of a back-end sales load. So a B share is a back-end loaded fund. Uh, typically, the back end load starts at 6%, and then every year that you have it, it usually goes about one percentage point lower to at the end of the six years, you could sell out of it with no additional back end fees. The problem with a B share versus an A share is your management expense is typically going to be higher on a B share, maybe about 50% higher. So you didn't have to pay anything up front going into it, but you will have to potentially pay some money to take it out, and if you end up keeping it a long period of time, you're going to end up paying an overall higher management uh, expense every single year. The third share class is a C share, and this is one that I really recommend that everybody avoid. Uh, a C share can sound good because when you put the money in, just like an A share, uh, there's no upfront sales load or commission. So say you put $1,000 in, all $1,000 gets invested for you right up front. Then on the back end, there's really no back end charge unless you sell out of it in the first year. A lot of C-class uh, shares will have a penalty of just 1% if you were to get out of it during the first 12 months. But if you go beyond 12 months, then again, you can sell out of it and there's no additional uh, sales load or commission that has to be paid. So that sounds good, right? But, but the problem with these types of share classes is the fact that your ongoing management fees are going to be the highest that they can be. Uh, they're typically about double the cost on an annual basis as an A share, and again, maybe about 50% higher than a B share, and this is an additional fee that you're going to have to pay each and every year moving forward. So on the surface, they can sound kind of good, but over time, they're just going to become far too costly. So I would definitely avoid C shares completely, and the way, that, again, that you can tell if you have C shares or not is by checking your statement to see which share class that you have. So as far as which one you should use or which one's most appropriate, I think an A share can be appropriate for maybe a large sum of money that you plan on investing for a long period of time. Again, you can maybe qualify for breakpoints where you have a reduced load. A B share may make sense for a lower, small amount, uh, lower amount of money that you plan on having invested for a long period of time uh, because then you don't have to pay anything up front. And moving forward, as long as you keep it for a long period of time, you're not going to pay any sales load on the back end. And then really, if you think about it, the only time that a C-share would be appropriate is if you're investing a small amount of money for a short period of time. Uh, that's really the only time you'd ever want to use a C-share. And, and in that situation, I would really argue that you shouldn't have any money invested in mutual funds to begin with. Because if you invest money in the stock market or in the bond markets, typically what you should be doing is making a long-term investment, not a short-term. So of the three, maybe A-shares would be the best. Uh, C-shares, I think, would be the worst. But in my opinion, I think it's probably best to avoid uh, these types of share classes completely. 
One of the things you can do if you want to is you can go with what's called a no-load fund or you can work with a registered investment advisor who doesn't work on a commission or doesn't charge these high front-end or back-end sales loads and certainly doesn't work with C-shares. And you can buy and sell into mutual funds without really any uh, commission or additional uh, sales loads like we know the majority of mutual funds are going to carry. So again, avoid C-shares completely. You can find out if you have them by uh, checking your statement. And if you do have C-shares, then by all means, give us a call at the office. We can find out exactly what the expense ratio is that you're paying and then obviously look at some lower cost alternatives.